Hey there guys, Rickon here, and welcome back to Let's Read Cattle Share Joe. In the last episode, we did stuff. It's like, I like how I, I actually just recorded that one. And I don't remember what happened. That's, that's pretty fantastic. But, what I do know is that should I go fast enough, this should be an interesting episode. Because I got the scene list up, and that'll probably be next episode from the looks of it. Just seems a little too far away. Either way. I mean, if you've seen the arc before, you, I think you know what's coming up. So, let's get into it. Some days later, I spot Ren and Say standing together in front of the gallery as I walk down the street toward the gallery. They seem to be talking to each other while Say has a smoke. Good afternoon. I say this even though it's not really afternoon anymore. It came a bit later than usual since I got caught up doing homework. It's going to be dark soon. Hello there, Rosal. Came to visit the little kitten again. Vern makes her face as the nickname. I guess she doesn't like it. Ironically, the way she wrinkles her nose like that really does make her look a little bit like a cat. Hello. Say turns back to Ren to continue the conversation they were having. So, in other words, everything is going well enough? Ren makes a difficult expression and turns her face away from me for some reason. It's difficult. It's like I'm missing something. That'll do it. Work hard and it'll be fine. I'm going to have to start working on my part for the preparations. I need, to, I need to do a sales catalog, invitations, decorations, advertisement, and so on. I need the names for your work, so we also need to think of a general theme for the exhibition. I don't have anything like that. I'm not very good with words, so I don't use them. If I cannot use them. I mean, sometimes I have to, but I think this is not a time like that at all. You don't like naming your works? I don't like it. Well, I get started to come up with a good name for something like this. Ren shakes her head vehemently. It's not like that. If I paint a cloud and call it an octopus, people will think about it differently than if I paint a cloud and call it the end of the world. Every name is wrong. Nothing ever explains what I feel like when I make a painting. It's not a word thing. The only thing would be to come up with a new word for everything. But would it help at all? No, I don't think so. Then the paintings would just go with unnamed number one and so on. It's a bit inconvenient, but... That's no good. A name means you just get, didn't come up with a good name. An unnamed is a name, like the Greek guy with the sheep and all. She's referencing the Odyssey with nobody and... Uh, was it Polyphemus? Think. I think it was Polyphemus. Think. And it's not because I read Percy Jackson's Sea of Monsters. That's, that's the one, right? Pretty sure, pretty sure it's Sea of Monsters that Polyphemus was in. But yeah, she referenced the Odyssey. I approve of that message. I don't know why I had to include that, but man, what the hell. Say thinks about this for a while, furrowing her brow, she keeps looking at Rin's serious face. So you're saying your artwork should be completely without labels? I think that's what I'm saying. Say lets out a dry laugh, the kind of old ladies who smoke too much always seem to end up with. Let's hope your art would never end up in the museum. The curators would explode. She takes a contemplative puff on her cigarette, which has worn down not much, which has worn down not much more than the butt. Then she drops it into an ashtray affixed to the wall next to the door. Then again, it could work. What do you mean? This namelessness, this projection of labels, works. It's a good unifying theme. It's something people can grasp onto easily. It allows for a lot of room for interpretation. It gives a good impression. Think about it. All sorts of asset associations can be made, starting from identifying self, starting from identi identity, self-definition, to de mother definition, all the way to whatever you want to think about it. We could call your exhibition nameless and build it on the theme. How does that sound? Rin thinks about this for a moment. I'm not sure how Say managed to get so fired up by Rin's reluctance to apply names to her works. It feels like she might be extrapolating too much, but it's a pretty impressive sounding idea. I don't think it's a bad idea. For what it's worth, I have to say, it sounds pretty good to me, too. Say reaches into her pocket for another cigarette, lighting it with a neon green butane lighter. Her forehead wrinkles and she rubs it as she appears to furiously think more on this idea. She doesn't say a word for a little bit, but every now and then she get, takes a sharp drag from the cigarette. Yes, I think this would work out pretty nicely. I'm going to take this at the starting point and work from there. I'm going in to work on this. You go back upstairs and try to find your missing ingredient. I'm sure it'll come to you sooner or later. 
Brennan doesn't reply, so Sled Tank takes one last long pull from her cigarette and drops into the tray, join the others with its, join with others of its kind. The gallery owner turns to head back inside, but is stopped by Brennan just as she reaches for the door for the door handle. Say, what is it, kitten? Can I have some cigarettes? She looks at Ren incredulously, clearly not having expected such a direct request. Not that I did either. Don't tell your teacher. Ren's, she stuffs the, the packet in Rin's pocket along with the neon green lighter. Well, this can only go... great. The day is already folding into dusk when we climb up the dark stairs leading to what is now basically Ren's atelier. As we go inside, Rin doesn't seem to be able to settle down. She keeps pacing around the room like a caged animal, looking through the skylight at the burgundy-colored dusk. The last light of the sun's advance across the sky reflects from the clouds floating over the town, filling every corner of the outlier with blazing orange light. So painting is going well? She blinks and relaxes her muscles. I didn't even realize how dense up she was until now. Not really. I haven't painted in three days. I'm going in squares. Circles. If you say so. I tried doing things a bit differently, but it doesn't work. Now the old way doesn't work either. I need something more. It's not enough like this. Rin's response gives me pause, since as usual I can't exactly understand what she means. Although really, I shouldn't have expected anything else. She either says nothing at all, or too much. Trying to comprehend and follow her train of thought feels like wading through the jungles of Borneo equipped with a wooden spoon and a map of, Ho map of Hokkaido. It's annoying how her thoughts are both laid out in plain sight and hidden from view every time she opens her mouth. What more? You said that to say as well. Missing ingredient? I think I have to destroy myself. Okay, that sounds unnecessarily grim. What do you mean? Ren's shoulders slump. She turns to face me directly. I have to change. I've tried, but this is not enough yet. I have to destroy myself at the first, I think. Just to be clear, you were speaking metaphorically, right? Like learning to paint from scratch again or whatever, so to speak. She shrugs her shoulders as if there's no difference. There is no difference. So, you were going to start by smoking a cigarette. For inspiration? Maybe. I've never tried this before. Have you? No? Can't say I have. Still, I'm not really sure if having a smoke is the best starting point. She responds to my words with another non nonchalant shrug. I open the cigarette pack and look inside. It's almost full. Smoking is bad for you, but that's the idea here, I guess. Yes, I need to do something. I want to paint. I need something more. So, okay, fine. What's after smoking a cigarette, then? How do you intend to destroy yourself? Rin thinks for a split second, diverting her gaze like she does when she doesn't want to get distracted. I don't know yet. I'll decide later. As I get interrupted by my headset battery being low, I have to plug it in. Good things. Good things, of course. Probably gonna cut this out later. All this noise, I gotta cut it out. I don't know yet. I'll decide later. Rin bends down to pick out a cigarette from the end. She raises her head with one between her lips and turn, turns to me, eyebrows curved into two arcs, challenging me to respond. With a sigh of resignation, I pick up the lighter and race it to meet the cigarette. I can feel Rin's warm breath against my quivering hand. The flame flickers to life on the third strike of the flint. I try to aim the dancing fire at the end of the cigarette. An amber-colored grow, grow, an amber-colored glow seems. I don't. Okay, it's in the next line. I get that. An amber-colored glow spreads onto the wrapping paper, into the wrapping paper, and tobacco is written inhales the first smoke. It seems to relax her significantly. To my surprise, she doesn't cough, despite her telling me that she's a first timer. Rin seems to remember that it's hard to blow the smoke out without spitting the cigarette out as well. She quickly sits down on the floor, bringing her foot to her lips like a circus contortionist, and expertly picks the filter between two toes. I get down on the floor as well, and we both lie down almost sim simultaneously while Rin blows a steady, a steady stream of smoke toward the dim sky beyond the, class the glass of the skylight, looking after it thoughtfully. The thin haze of steely blue smoke slithers toward the ceiling in fish-like movements. It billows in the stagnant air of the outlier, twisting and turning around its own immaterial body until it dissipates in thin air. What's that word for smoke that looks like that? There is no word for that. We should maybe come up with one. Maybe. 
Rin takes another quick experimental drag. Not very tasty. Feels like inhaling the dust lying on top of a forgotten book about the memories of a dead kingdom. Do you want to try? My hand's hesitation unintentionally surfaces again, making me freeze in the face of a rather trivial and commonplace challenge. Rin's ability to take everything so coolly is something I'm, I'm a bit jealous of. Alright. Peer pressure's a bad thing, Casal. That's how the feminist yet get you. Bad, Hassal. Taking it from her, I have a drag on it, fighting against the sudden choking feeling in my lungs as they fill with smoke. To my embarrassment, I fail, wheezing and hacking my lungs out. I feel flustered, but maybe I haven't lost, lost too much face in Ren's eyes. It's less unpleasant on the second try, but I still pass the cigarette back to Ren. We're like a pair of budding delinquents in middle school, sneaking the first smoke out of sight of their teachers and parents. Well, I suppose it's not like, that's exactly what we are. After a while, the cigarette has shrunk most of the way down to the filter. Ren is still looking quietly out of the skylight. With her looking out there, the silence inside the atelier seems to deepen a bit even more. Are the cogs of creativity turning behind those eyes right now? Do another one. I mechanically pick another cigarette, light it and place it on Ren's lips. She takes a few quick puffs and moves it awkwardly around with her lips. Fake fit. Not understanding her garbled words, I glance over at Ren. Looks like she's having trouble with the cigarette. I pick the cigarette from her lips and place it on mine, abandoning common sense and good reason while I do so. The first one should have been enough for me, but I take another drag, still coughing a little at the unpleasant sensation of smoke invading my respiratory organs. I remember doing something like this before. So you have smoked? Doesn't look like it, though. Nah, I'm lying on my back and looking at the sky with you. Oh. The sky on the other side of the glass is slowly growing darker. It's unreachably high, even if the shimmering smoke seems to make it closer. I return the cigarette back to Rin's mouth. It feels bad somehow. The space between us, less than arm's reach, is still there. It's the distance between us, the immeasurably wide chasm of thoughts and feelings that separates, separates us with graver, uns, graver certainty than even light years of physical distance could. By saying the right words, there might be a way to make that chasm narrower, even if it's just a little. I tried to cross that one gap with one big step, but Ren turned me back. I glance at her out of the corner of my eye. Ren is staring upwards through the smoke-filled ceiling in the sky of the darkening sky above us. It's almost like she's sleeping even though I know she isn't. Her eyes are open as is her mouth. I take the cigarette from Ren before it falls on her cheek. She doesn't react in my touch in any, to my touch in any way. So, this is where we are now. I wonder if we can ever be closer than this. I take a drag of the cigarette and blow a thin stream of smoke upward. These indirect kisses are the only things that connect us right now. The taste of Ren's lips on the filter mixed with the ashen taste of the smoke. Her soft lips against my fingers as I press the cigarette on her mouth as if she was placing kisses on them. The ash softly falling on the floor between us like snow. As the second cigarette is being finished, I'm off. I'm already lighting the third one. The only thing breaking the stillness of the atelier is the inaudible sound of smoke floating toward the first stars blinking overhead. Light nausea hits me by the fourth or fifth cigarette. Before long, the shape of the waxing moon appears in the skylight, shedding her wan light down on us. It'll be full moon, full moon in a few days. It'd be nice to be able to fly. I flinch after realizing it was on my own voice that gave birth to the remark, the bastard child of the almost inebriating smoke and tiredness. You can't? You can? Sometimes I feel like it, like I can do anything. Wish I felt like that too sometimes. I wonder if she hears the bitterness creep seeping in my words. The vicious cycle of unrequited feelings is poisoning me even now. I try to push the grim thoughts aside. My efforts meet with little success as my mind keeps swirling about what ifs and if onlys. Watching the moon slowly creeping higher, I realize that a long time has passed since I came here. It sobers me somewhat, but also reminds me of the sad status quo we're in now. It's late. I better get going, going back. I better get going back to school. I stand up to leave, but Ren doesn't show any sign of rising up from the floor. She lies in an as though all life had been sapped from her. Little wisps of smoke float about her, memories of the cigarettes we shared. I grasp by the, by the short and thin arm and try to pull her up. To my surprise, she complies and stands up with some help from me. I notice how little Ren weighs, as if she were made of feathers. Are you going to stay here overnight? I have to. I haven't painted much in three days. I have to find out. How I can. I have to find out how I can start painting. Maybe the smoke helps. 
Just take a break? That's no good. I have to do it. If I can't paint anymore, I'll be destroyed for real. Maybe you're just burned out. You've been working pretty hard. That would be bad. What if this is it for me? Wanted to see how far I can go. Maybe this is it. The end. You just have artist block. It's not a big deal. That's the word for when you can't paint, right? I've had that before. Never like this, but never like this though. I pick a, br a brush, then want to put it down right away, and then I do. Three days. It's like I've forgotten how to paint. I didn't think that was possible. Like more possible than Emmy growing wings and a tail. You need a break. I mean, I get that you're trying to go deeper inside yourself for pa your paintings, but it's not really that healthy to stay inside your own head for so long. I glance at the night sky visible through the window. A couple of stars are weakly twinkling, twinkling above the city. They remind me of something I used to do once upon a time. It feels so horribly long ago. Come on, let's go outside. Where? Just for a walk. I'll show you my secret place. I don't know if it works in this town, but we can try. In any case, you need a break. Probably something to eat. Come on. You need to get your thoughts away from this for a while. When they're troubled, most people escape from their unhappy lives into a world of fantasy. I did that before, and still do today, reading books endlessly, immersing myself in their world rather than my own. Rin's escape should be the other way around, though, out of her inner world and into the real. Rin doesn't look happy about this, but I ignore her. At least she's somewhat cooperative, walking after me as we head down the stairs and then down the sidewalk. Night has fallen upon the town. It's a gentle summer night, feel smelling of flowers and hot asphalt. Sunlight is replaced by the shining neon colors and bland yellow streetlights. The air is easy to breathe, as if the air pressure was not noticeably lighter than usual. The feeling of daytime in the hot summer has lasted long into the evening and night. I grab Brynn by her sleeve like I've seen Emmy do, and to my surprise, she obediently follows. The pale streetlights fight against the all-enveloping darkness as we walk together, the, gu the guide and the guided, although neither knows the destination. But it doesn't matter. This is the one moment where the usual silences have become a ritual between me and Rin and last fit perfectly. We walk side by side, choosing directions on impulse or inspiration. Sometimes we find ourselves back at a street we'd already seen once or twice. Sometimes we find new streets. All of them look asleep. Rin doesn't ask where we're going. Maybe she doesn't care. Maybe she knows I don't have an answer. The silence of the night isn't scary. After all, the lights, the lights drive most of it away. There it goes... The air grows cooler as the moon progresses along its journey in the cloudless sky. Few cars roam at the streets at this hour, and even fewer people on the sidewalk. The apparent lack of nocturnal life is somehow befitting of this place. There are around-the-clock shops and cafes, sure, but the atmosphere is like the town itself is slumbering, a town that sleeps eight hours a day. The city I grew up in, bathed in the electric glow of a million light bulbs, never slept. I've seen it for myself. It's not the first time I've done this. It happened one of the first times I was home alone. Both of my parents had business trips that neither could cancel, to, so they deemed me old enough to survive two days on my own. Their misplaced trust in me did not go to waste as I proceeded, proceeded to spend the entire night out walking around the city. Even afterward, I couldn't say what made me stay downtown longer than I intended after school. I didn't feel like going home, so I stayed through the evening and eventually through the entire night. I walked long, concentric circles around a landmark chosen at random. For some reason, the nighttime city felt fascinating. So I walked its streets. At every intersection, it was possible to choose a direction at random because they all led nowhere. The aimless wandering made me see things differently. I hope it'll do the same for Ren. We stopped to buy some hot coffee and snacks from a vending machine, and then locate a bench where we sit down to eat. There's no time in the night of the town, so we spend an unknown amount of just sitting there, observing the stillness of the usually vivid townscape. Still, it's getting very late, and soon it'll be getting very early. So is this it? Hearing Rin's voice surprises me. She doesn't sound bored. Rather, her tone is inquisitive, uncertain as to why I dragged her out here, yet curious to find out the answer. Yeah. Have you ever been out all night? It's like a different world. The remark sends her thinking for a while, looking around as if she were looking for something. The wisps of light reflecting from the corners of her eyes are suddenly very sharp. It's not a different world. It's the same, just sleep. What do you think this town is dreaming of? Maybe something like car sheep or building sheep. Why are dreams always about sheep? I've never seen a sheep-related dream that I can remember. Do different towns dream of different things? Probably. How could they not? I answered half-joking, half spurring her on. For the first time tonight, it seems like a bit of Rin's life has returned to her. She doesn't continue her list of rhetorical questions, though. Instead, she leans back in a little and looks at the moon traveling above the town. 
The cool breeze blowing between the buildings seems to steal the conversation away before it even really begins. It's too bad. It looked like Rin would get out of her blue mood. I wish I could somehow know the right things to say, but I realize I can't do that the way I am now. I'm too far apart from Rin. I haven't really managed to crack her open. She's just too complicated. It's like she's open to everything, equally disinterested in everything from the outset. In truth, she's locked tighter than anyone else I know, even myself. Sometimes she locks herself inside that inner world, shutting everything else out. At other times, her thoughts for, flow freely from her mind, but not organized in any fashion that would make, that would make them in, intelligible to the rest of the world. What comes out in the form of paintings, I can't interpret. To me, it's just a sea of colors and shapes, not a message. She's too far away. I now know it was a bad idea to try to reach for her in the way I did, but I can't help liking her. I look at the fingers of my right hand, trying to remember what Rin's lips felt like against them. Do you ever feel like you're trying to reach out for something that's impossible to reach? Rin turns her gaze at me, tilting her head quizzically. I wonder if she understands the meaning of my own rhetorical question or not. Either way, I like how I can manage to catch her attention just by speaking aloud nowadays. All the time. At least I think so. That's what painting feels like a lot of the time. Or all the time. I don't know. Sometimes I get the feeling that I can't can really paint. Sometimes I get the feeling that I can really play, paint what I want. Sometimes it feels like it's just in the shadow of me. Like a mirror that doesn't work right. Like talking? Maybe. When I was little, I didn't really have friends. Maybe it's the same now. The only things I like were pens and paints. They were the only things that understood me. Now it feels like that is going away too. Change really is a scary thing. I wish I could understand you. She looks at me melancholically, roused by my thoughts materializing as words spoken aloud. Me too. Whether she meant she wished for me to understand her, her to understand me, or her to understand herself, I never ask, nor do I find out. I see her eyes searching for mine. Serious and cryptic as they are, I'm not getting an expl any explanation from there. Don't worry about it. I will. Small hints of a smile are wav wavering on her lips. When she's like this, it makes me feel that maybe there's hope for us. We get along so well for being so different. It's just that we never really get along precisely because we are so different. Maybe it was Rin's passionate approach for her own art exhibition, or perhaps my own careless words, but last week was different from usual. The small friction between us seems to be somewhat volatile, but at least we now seem to be back to normal. Relatively speaking. We stand up from the bench and pick yet another direction in which to go. The wee hours of night slowly pass as we measure the streets of the town, one step at a time. We are finally at ease, not minding the rare lone passerby, the eerie darkness each other, ourselves. Rin's step seems lighter, like the heavy air around her is letting go a little. It makes me feel happy. We don't talk, save for the single remark that is spoken into the night of the town and never answered. The details jump into the eye instead of being the usual blur they are during the day. As the sky above changes from deep, dark blue to gray, I know that our night is soon ending. It's almost morning. Rin looks up too and nods at me. It's true. The coming light of morning is creeping through the sky, climbing higher by the minute. It feels surreal. The sun won't come up for a while, but I get the feeling that the end of this night really is here and now. Should we head back? Rin nods again, twice, her hair waving in the breeze that seems to be her heralding the coming dawn. Abruptly, she takes off, taking the lead in this walkabout on which I brought her. It seems she really is in a better mood. This, too, makes me feel happy. Rin's navigational skills are probably not much better than mine, but we eventually find ourselves in front of Say's place. I don't know if this was any help. I did this once before, but it was more because of a stupid impulse or maybe restlessness, restlessness back then. Maybe this was a silly, a silly idea and didn't really help you at all. She just nods as an answer. So, do you know how you're going to destroy yourself now? I have some ideas. I don't want to see you for a while. Don't come and see me. Do something else. Her ultimatum catches me completely off guard. What the hell? What's that about? You said before that you didn't mind. I mind now. It's just for a while. I have to do this alone. I don't like that. Why? I don't want it to go like this. Why? I just don't want to feel this distance between you and me. She tilts her head like a bird, her eyes narrowing a little as she thinks. Then you can touch me. What? You can touch me if you want. You'd feel better, right? I don't know. Try. Where do you want me to touch you? 
No boobs are left here. Other than that, you can decide. Fine. I raise my hand hesitantly, even though I don't know why I'm actually doing this. Her eyes tell me that she's not going to explain. A thousand thoughts race through my head as I slowly bring my hand closer to Rin's face and press three fingers against her pale cheek. Rin feels soft, soft and cold. She closes her eyes in contact and visibly relaxes. I can feel her soft breathing, her muscles releasing tension as my fingertips caress her cheek. She doesn't rest her head against my palm or anything else you'd expect a girl to do now in this sort of situation. In fact, she hasn't reacted at all, save for those now shut eyes. Once I withdraw my hand, she opens them again. It might be just an illusion created by the timid morning sunlight playing with my eyes, but Rin looks like she's holding back a smile. This is the problem with our relationship. Half the time I have no idea what is going on, and the other half I just fail to understand why things are going on like they are. As usual, I'm not going to get an explanation. Rin merely takes God damn it. Rin merely takes a step toward the door. See you later. Then she disappears from my reach for an undefined amount of undefined period of time. Now, personally, I think that her reason for saying that she didn't want to see him could possibly be that she needs time to think about their rela relationship and whatnot. He's put these thoughts in her head and she needs to sort them out and paint. So, you know, she just needs time. Now, of course, next time we see her, oof, we know what's going to happen. You know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and all that, but... I hold true to my promise of honoring Ren's request, even if it's against my own will. I try to redirect my focus into my studies, but I end up zoning out during classes and doing, doing only the minimum amount of work required. Still, I start looking into my post-high school options a bit more seriously. I pour over university brochures and various career paths. I'm good at studying, so I want to go to a university. I'm pretty sure I could get into a pretty decent one, too. The only problem is deciding which subject would be best. Kenji ridicules me about subjecting myself to the control of feminist teachers when I tell him about trying to get into a university. I don't ask him about what he wants to do in the future. Clearly he's going to be the leader of the resistance. Duh. I mean, this is Kenji we're talking about. I wonder what Ren thinks of her own future. I bet she's not as lost as I am. And if she is, it's probably in some completely different way. I feel somewhat disappointed in finding out that I can't stop thinking about her. Well, you know, so she might be the same way. It's not as likely, but eh, you never know. Her request makes me worry about her and think about her more than I did when I could go and see her when I wanted. It bothers me that I can. As expected, I eventually crack. Late one afternoon, I get on the bus heading downtown. I try to a voice explaining to myself why exactly I'm doing this. I keep thinking about other things for the entire duration of the trip. After a five minute walk, I'm standing in front of the gallery. I walk past through the door of the atelier, but at the last moment I lose my courage and continue on all the way to the next corner, at which point I turn back. Will Ren hate me if I go and see her? I wonder what she's like when she's angry. I've never seen her angry. The worst thing would be if I actually ruined something by going to see her, like she seemed to imply what happened. But there's no way that can be true, can there? It's just one of her quirks. I walk back down the street and end up passing the outlier door for the second time. Only this time I continue all the way down. Only this time, as I continue all the way to the gallery, its owner is standing just outside the door, watching me. I thought that was you. What are you doing? I really don't want to explain the circumstances between Lynn and I, so I get flustered and end up mumbling something unclear. I, um. She takes stock of me and then sighs deeply, looking wildly amused somehow. I hope she didn't misunderstand. Would you like to come in? The teacher's visiting, and we were discussing Ren's exhibition. Ah, thanks for the invitation, but I really should. Don't be shy now. Come on in. I follow Say inside, finding that our art teacher indeed is there. Nami is standing at the big desk, contemplating what looks like an invitation card. Look what the cat dragged in. Nakai! Hello there, my boy. My boy. He doesn't seem to be at all phased by my appearance. How do you like the invitations? I glance at them quickly. They're kind of fancy with one of Rin's paintings printed on the front cover in shiny gold writing. They look fine to me. They're magnificent! I absolutely love the design and the embossed gold lettering. Fabulous! Good print work, too. You have to tell me where you get these done. What does Rin think? I haven't asked. She said she'd be fine with my decision anyway. Nami laughs boisterously, still t turning the gold-lettered card in his hands. 
That's my girl. She wants to focus on the essentials only. Good for her. Her work is progressing well, too. It seems she's found new inspiration. I think she's been sort of weird lately. It's like she's wrestling with something with herself, probably, and it makes her confused. She said she had a hard time painting the last time I saw her. Seems to be resolved now, however. You know, she practically lives up there now, right? Sam makes a simple gesture with her hand as if, as if sweeping my question aside. Sure. Don't you think that's weird? Maybe it is. Still, I think she understands how big an opportunity this is and it's going forth for it full throttle. Is it really that big? Nami sets the card down and brushes, brushes some imaginary dust off his jacket. Well, how should I put it? There are times in everyone's lives where something really big washes over you and changes you forever. This could be just that moment for Tezuka. I see. Yeah, I think I've had something like that happen to me. I'm referring to the incident that brought me to Maku. Neither of the two adults comments on that, however. It might be one that everyone has, or will. At any rate, sur surrendering oneself to art is a big decision, and a thorny path too. Quite thorny indeed. Tezuka has almost everything one needs, but whether she has the will to pull through, that's a different question. I should know that best. I tried going down this path too, but turned away in the end. I don't understand what he's trying to say. Alright, well, we're... This... Uh, Teensy wins a bit over time, so... I'm gonna end this video off here, and next time, if you know the arc, you know exactly what's gonna happen. We might actually end up ending off Act 3 as well. Possibly. But we'll have to see. Odds are we can. But we'll see. So anyway, I'm reckoning you, the viewer... If you so choose to, like the video, comment the video. Oh my god, it's not like I'm, it's not like I'm doing critical th criticals thing. So that's it for this video. Uh, god damn, I don't remember what it is though, and I don't have internet to check. God damn it. Uh, so that's the end of the vi this video. Uh, rate the video, comment the video, and subscribe for other videos similar to this one. <laughs> that's it, more or less. God damn it, so... <laughs> I need to watch some of his videos again. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. So, you know, I'm reckoning you, the viewer, you know, like, favorite, comment if you so choose to, subscribe if you really feel like it, but eh, it's up to you. And, uh, I'll see you in the next video. Just don't go destroying yourself or anything. Probably wouldn't be a good idea. Unless you need to for your art, you know, then you kind of have to, right? <laughs>